Hello, my name is Lindsay Irwin and I'm the administrator of the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham in Norfolk and formerly uh, Bishop of Horsham for well, 15 years. And if I may, I'd just like to talk for a few minutes about the legislation currently before the General Synod to admit women to the Episcopate. Uh, now here, I, I'm not wanting to question people's uh, views about the ordination of women as bishops. I accept, along with other uh, so-called traditionalists, that most people have come to the conclusion that it is appropriate for the Church of England to admit women to the Episcopate. But what I am concerned about is whether this legislation is the right legislation, both for that process and also for a proper provision for those of us who in, in good conscience can't accept that this is the right move for us. Um, and just to say, if you remember, um, back in the early days of discussion about this when the Rochester report was presented, there was a sort of, in the preamble and throughout that document, and in other documents too, an acknowledgement of, of the virtues of the argument uh, presented by those who do not believe this is appropriate for the Church of England. Um, recently I was listening to, to um, the Jewish uh, writer Amos Oz, and uh, he's a person who has been promoting for years a two-state solution in what we call the Holy Land. And he said something that's been very helpful to me anyway, and that is the idea that in some conflicts, the idea that there's a right and a wrong just isn't nuanced enough, and that actually there might be, uh, to put it this way, two rights. Well, uh, that is to say, two, two views that are compelling, two views that have um, their claim upon the community. And certainly uh, the Rochester report presented that, didn't it? that uh, the majority of folk, um, after reflection, believe that it's right for the Church of England to admit women to the Episcopate, but also an acknowledgement that this precious gift of Episcopacy, of bishops, isn't just our possession, that as Anglicans, uh, we have always acknowledged that this is a gift that doesn't just belong to us, but belongs to, well, I'd say, the Church Catholic, of which we are a part. And of course, as you well know, Roman Catholics and the Orthodox have this gift and treasure it. And they uh, do not believe that it's appropriate to admit women to that uh, office. And I suppose I represent uh, and belong to a company of believers within our own church who hold to that sort of more traditional uh, Catholic view. So. Um, this is not just a question of ecumenical relations, but relations within. And the Rochester report, I think, acknowledged a sort of both a rightness about the admission of women to the Episcopate and a sort of, um, not hesitancy, a, a holy hesitancy, a, a realization that actually there was a sort of provisionality about it, even if we believed it to be right, because of the views of the wider church. And until there is a greater consensus then, then uh, we should have the humility to acknowledge um, the alternate view. And the question is whether this legislation really celebrates that other right view, that more traditional view, in our life together. Now, it's a serious thing to, to disagree with an archbishop um, publicly and uh, especially one who has been a great supporter, personally to me anyway, and to many traditional Catholics. But the Archbishop of Canterbury's recent plea uh, for us to accept the current legislation, well, I have to question it. And I now know that I'm also questioning the views of the new Archbishop of Canterbury, but, but I must. Now, some five years ago, I think it was, at a College of Bishops meeting that I attended, um, uh, in the discussion about this, and it was a godly discussion, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury caused a sort of a corporate intake of breath when he suggested that a two-diocese solution might be appropriate in a provision for uh, those of the more traditional mind. Not, not hermetically sealed, brick-walled diocese, of course not, but, but that sort of stream of provision where uh, a, a male-only presbyterate and a male-only episcopate would care for traditionalists, people who had that theological view but in other ways, of course, we would share life together. Uh, well, uh, that sort of intake of breath meant that actually that view was lost by the next day. And um, 
Then, in 2010, the two archbishops presented an amendment to the proposed legislation which, which allowed for the possibility, it, it sort of accepted um, the traditionalist view and what would be necessary not only to believe it, but to live it as a community. Um, uh, with, with an amendment which would have allowed a certain structure within the whole for traditionalists. And that too was rejected. Uh, and then of course, and you will know, I'm not a member of Synod, but you will know um, that amendment, most recently, Amendment 51C, I think it was, in which uh, uh, there was a further suggestion um, by the House of Bishops uh, of, of a sort of structured provision uh, that suggested that uh, uh, priests would be appointed and bishops would be appointed to care for traditionalists who held the same theological convictions and views. Well, that was thrown back to the House of Bishops by the Synod as unacceptable, um, and they were asked to think again, and now we have this particular legislation uh, asking for respect, that's the category that's used, with the idea that this could have some legal uh, basis, sort of, even if you don't have respect, you must have respect um, for uh, the traditionalist view. Well, those of us uh, who long for there to be a long-term provision for traditionalists that will allow us to flourish and grow alongside our brothers and sisters do not believe that this is sufficient. Uh, those of us with experience of the Act of Synod in the past, since the Ordination of Women as Bishops, know that actually in its outworking it's depended almost entirely on the goodwill or not of diocesan bishops and their staff. And when there have been disputes in the past um, and people have appealed beyond the diocesan bishop, there's been very, very little help, to be perfectly honest. And sometimes as a traditionalist can feel not that there's a sense of rightness about your view in the mix, but rather this is something to be put up with until we either change our minds or, or frankly die out. Um, well, how to deal with dispute, and frankly, this legislation does not deal adequately with that. It suggests that if there is a dispute about the code of practice, which has not yet been written, actually, to deal with the legislation, if there is a dispute, it can go to judicial review, that is, to the secular court. And surely this is a pointer to the inadequacy of this legislation, that actually we would go to the secular court to deal with our disputes. And even if we do, who pays? If it's a bishop, the church commissioners. If it's a little group of parishioners in a church who, who walk the old way, they must pay for their own. This is surely uh, inappropriate. Inappropriate. My feeling is that to vote no for this legislation is not necessarily to vote no for the ordination of women as bishops. There are two issues, women bishops and this particular legislation. This legislation does not honour the two rightnesses, as it were. And we need, it seems to me, more time, more waiting upon the Lord, more listening to each other, more reflection about how we can appropriately express this diversity uh, within the unity of our own church. So my prayer, my hope is that even those of you who are strongly in favour of women bishops will hesitate before you vote yes for this particular legislation, which we believe very strongly does not adequately, adequately provide for those of us of the traditional mind.